Michael Mann shows us the science behind Texas's major winter storm. Check it out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. On the, uh, on the line with us is the, uh, one of the world's leading climate scientists, Dr. Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Meteorology, the Director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University, member of the National Academy of Sciences, representative, uh, recipient excuse me, of the Tyler Prize, the author of several books, his latest, The New Climate War, his previous, The Madhouse Effect, Michael Mann with two N's, dot net is his website, uh, Twitter handle, Michael E. Mann with two N's. And, uh, and Michael and I have uh, appeared in several documentaries together, and uh, he's just a, an extraordinary man. Uh, Dr. Mann, uh, no, no pun intended. Dr. Mann, welcome back to the program. Um, please describe for us why Texas is so cold right now. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's always a pleasure uh, to be on the show with you, my friend. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you hear from climate change deniers is, this idea that a cold winter outbreak like the one we're seeing in Texas is somehow a disproof of human-caused climate change. And the reality is it's, it's nothing of the sort. If you look at all of the records, cold and warm over time, we're seeing all-time records for warmth around the world. If you count up every day of the year um, in every location on the Earth, and you can tally how often in any one location you break uh, the record uh, for that day, either the warm record or the cold record. And the warm records are outpacing the cold records two to one, which is exactly what we expect in a cooling, in, in a warming world. Um, but here's the thing. There may be some evidence that the cold extremes aren't going away as quickly as the hot extremes are increasing. And that may be because climate change not only is warming up the planet, but it's changing the behavior of the jet stream, of our atmosphere. And we do seem to be getting uh, an unusually large number of these bitter Arctic uh, cold air outbreaks in recent years, in, in midwinter in the United States, um, like we're seeing right now. And it's associated with the so-called polar vortex that we hear so much about. If the polar vortex weakens, um, it, it's what bottles up the cold air in the Arctic. And if that tight band of winds that's associated with the jet stream and what we call the, the polar vortex, if that weakens, then you can sort of get these cold blobs that sort of break off and drift down into lower latitudes. And that's what's happening right now. Now, there's some reason to believe that human-caused warming may actually weaken the polar vortex and weaken the jet stream. And that's because the Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet because of the melting of ice. Um, that leads to an amplifying effect. Uh, there's more warming in the Arctic than there is at lower latitudes. And that reduces the temperature contrast between the Arctic, which is warming up faster, and the subtropics. If you reduce that temperature contrast, then we understand the physics of that. Uh, you decrease the strength of the jet stream and the strength of the polar vortex. So it's at least plausible that the increase in these uh, cold air outbreaks may be related to how climate change is impacting our atmospheric circulation. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're seeing record cold. Uh, what everybody is getting so excited about here is something that would have been typical in the 1960s and the 1970s. It's just a bout, it's just a, um, a temporary episode of what we might call old fashioned cold. So we're not seeing record, all-time records for cold set here. We're just seeing sort of a cold that we haven't seen in, in some decades. And meanwhile, this year, this last summer, we set the record for the hottest temperature ever reliably recorded on the planet in Death Valley, California. So we need some perspective here. Mm -hmm. So if I could turn this into a metaphor for, for people who may not get the physics of it, um, if we were to think of, and, and, and please, uh, you know, uh, feel free to interrupt me if I get any of this wrong or you know, when, I'm, when I'm done with this, uh, you know, comment on it, please. Um, if, if we were to imagine that the Arctic is like an old medieval castle, um, you know, uh, uh, built in, in some place in Europe, and around that castle is a giant wall, you know, like the, like the wall around the old city of Jerusalem, for example, or the, you know, the wall around a lot of castles. 
and the and that wall is the jet stream and it is keeping and the castle is the arctic region with filled with very very cold air and so that jet stream wall that that's that band of high speed wind that that runs like a like a giant river around the around the northern uh, uh, polar region uh, circular all around the planet continuously that if if that wall weakens then the cold that is the castle inside the wall starts spilling out as the the wall actually deforms the wall itself will just like move you know a half a mile or or something in, in and I'm, I'm mangling this metaphor now but um and, and that and that castle cold comes with that moving wall and that's what that's what's happened the jet stream has bent or dipped all the way down to to mexico when normally it stops somewhere in central canada is that is that do i have that right yeah and if i can extend the metaphor and in fact bring in a princess bride reference because i never resist the opportunity to do that um, okay. it's sort of like we've opened up <laughs> we've opened up the portcullis um, the, the the gate to uh, that uh, fortress and allowed the cold air out um, and that's you know one way of thinking of this um, it's it's not a bad analogy at all in fact it's an analogy that's pretty faithful to the underlying mathematics and physics the idea that the, this tight band of winds is like a wall that keeps the cold walled in to the old city the Arctic. Um, and we've opened the door now. We've opened the portcullis and, and allowed the uh, the cold air to escape uh, out into lower latitudes of the United States, Europe, which is seeing similar cold. Of course, uh, many of your listeners may have seen the snowfall in Athens. I mean, we haven't seen that in a long time, but it's not unprecedented. What we're getting now mm -hmm. is a is you know an episode of old fashioned cold, not record breaking cold, but record breaking heat. We are seeing that every summer, and that's all consistent with a warming planet, with what we expect on a warming planet. Right. So are we seeing these, I mean, I, you and I had this conversation, it must have been five years ago, when I was living on a boat in, the, in, the, in, the, in Washington, D.C., you know, in the, in the harbor there, and uh, we had this, they called it a bomb cyclone, and it, it, it froze the, the Potomac River. You know where we were. We had these ice eaters uh, around the boat that were circulating the water to keep it from freezing and damaging the hull of the boat. It was uh, quite the emergency. And my recollection is that at the time you were saying, you know, expect this to happen more frequently. Am I remembering that correctly? And is that what's going on? Yeah. So you know, we it's it, it's possible that we're going to see more uh, frequent, uh, you know, Arctic blasts, cold air outbreaks. Now they won't be breaking all-time records for cold because the planet's warmed up so much and so mm -hmm. what that really means is we're we may not see the disappearance of extreme cold as quickly as we might expect on a warmer uh, on a warming planet we might expect to continue to see these cold air outbreaks um, even as the planet warms up because it's possible that climate change is creating a more favorable atmospheric environment for these cold air you know, masses to break off of the uh, polar vortex and drift down into lower latitudes. Uh, but it won't be record-breaking cold. It'll just be sort of that old-fashioned cold uh, that we grew up with in the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, you know, at the same time, of course, we're seeing new records for heat, and, and that's truly dangerous, right? Because we're not seeing cold that exceeds our human experience. Our, our so this experience is like the 60s, is the there? Last century. Uh, yeah. Michael, we're going to hit a break in 45 seconds. I, I, I know you can hang out with us a little longer, and I really appreciate that. But yeah. is this, as cold air is leaving the Arctic, is it being replaced at the Arctic with, with warm air from other latitudes? I mean, is this accelerating the melting of the Arctic? Uh, to an extent, there's evidence of that, right? What we're seeing is, is the uh, mixing process. So the cold air is drifting down into lower latitudes, but meanwhile, we're seeing a lot of warm air make it up into those higher latitudes, and that might impact. Uh, you know, Arctic, the melt of Arctic sea ice. And so that is something we have to keep a watch on. Dr. Mann, as I recall, back when you and I were discussing this a half a decade ago or thereabouts, um, at that point in time, there was, uh, as I recall, a, a, a scientist, a, my, my recollection is it was a woman, who was suggesting this theory that, that 
uh, the jet stream would weaken as a result of global warming because the Arctic was warming so much faster than the mid-latitudes and uh, that that was an explanation for some of the, uh, the, the polar vortex uh, situations we were seeing. And it was very controversial at that point in time in science. Um, what's the status of that perspective right now? You were, you were sort of quoting that a, a few minutes ago, but you yeah. did qualify it. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what evidence do we have uh, and, what, you know, and where is the skepticism? So there's an emerging body of evidence, and uh, I think you're alluding to uh, Jennifer Francis, who's really yes. played a very important role in, in investigating those connections and, in fact, uh, in communicating them to the public. And I was delighted that she recently won the Climate Communication uh, Prize of the American Geophysical Union for her efforts to really inform our conversation about these linkages. Um, and so, you know, Jennifer, she's at the uh, Woods Hole Research Center. She's continuing to publish research in this area, and I think she makes a credible case um, for these connections that we've talked about, that the accelerated warming of the Arctic may, in fact, be impacting the jet stream in a way that counterintuitively can lead to more of these uh, polar vortex breakdowns, like we've seen this winter and other previous winters. Um, there is still a scientific debate, um, and it's a healthy debate, right? This is the way science is supposed to be, and the critics like to say, oh, you know, where's the debate? Well, there's no debate about whether climate change is real or human caused. That's the a consensus of, uh, you know, the, the, the world scientific community and every scientific uh, organization, um, every academy that has investigated the science. We know that to be true. There isn't a debate about those things. How will climate change impact extreme winter, uh, extreme uh, weather events in the winter here in North America? There is a debate, and there are scientists who have challenged uh, Jennifer's findings. And Jennifer has counter challenges, and that all plays out in the peer reviewed literature and at scientific meetings the way science is supposed to work. So, science is working the way it's supposed to be working. They're the things that we know well, um, you know, and, and, and what we know well is that climate change is real, human caused. It's already a major threat, and it will be a much greater threat if we don't act. But all of the specifics about how it might impact certain types of extreme weather events, scientists are still in good faith debating some of those connections. So, uh, you know, I, I said we, we're seeing more extreme heat events. We, we, you know, there's a, we, I think that's fairly clear to everybody. Are we seeing more extreme cold events as, as well? No, what we, are, I, what we are seeing is more extreme cold than we might expect on a warming planet. So the extreme cold doesn't seem to be going away as fast as the extreme warmth is coming. It's sort of lopsided. The, the, the impact of the warming seems to, in this sense, be greater when it comes to extreme warm events than the diminishing of extreme cold events. And that might have to do with these changing, you know, changing conditions in the atmosphere, the impact of climate change on the jet stream, on the polar vortex. And again, that's an area where, you know, there are scientists uh, still debating in good faith with each other about those connections, but it's at least plausible that that's what we're seeing here. Now, there's a, an ocean current, um, sometimes referred to as the Great Conveyor Belt, that transports yeah. heat from the Pacific down around the southern tip of Africa, up the east coast of the United States, where we refer to it as the Gulf Stream. Um, it, it conveys some considerable heat, I believe, to, to the east coast of the U.S., moderates a moderating effect, and then it crosses the Atlantic and, and sinks back down to the lower oceans off the coast of, of Europe, basically, uh, the southern Greenland and, and uh, western uh, U.K. And that is the, my understanding is that current is the reason why Europe, which has a latitude similar to Alaska, actually has a climate similar to Indiana. Uh, a, do I have that right? And B, what is climate change doing to that? Yeah, and so yeah, basically what you describe is, is, is the situation. Now, it's a bit of a simplification because part of why Europe is so warm is the same reason that Seattle is so much warmer than you know, Labrador. Um, a similar latitude on the East Coast because you have these westerly winds, these winds from the west that are, you know, coming in off the ocean, which is relatively warm in the winter, and bringing that warmer maritime air um, as it 
makes uh, you know as it makes uh, you know it it it, it, it reaches us um, it reaches the land. Right. So so that's also so Europe even if the uh, so-called conveyor belt circulation, which as you say is sort of a, a an extension of what we think of as the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is really a, a term that scientists use more to describe the strong wind, uh, the, the strong ocean currents off the east coast, the mid-Atlantic east coast off of Cape Hatteras. And then it sort of curves around, travels north and east towards Iceland and Europe. And then it becomes what we call the North Atlantic Drift. Technically, it isn't the Gulf Stream anymore. It's a part of the Gulf Stream that sort of breaks away. It doesn't recirculate in the gyre and it travels north, and it does bring warmer waters to Iceland, to uh, coastal Europe, and it does have a moderating influence. Now, if the Gulf Stream uh, were to shut down, it turns out you probably wouldn't get Ice Age-like conditions in Europe because you still have those maritime winds uh, over the ocean that are bringing that warm oceanic air into Europe. And so the Gulf Stream, or what we really call the North Atlantic Drift, is only part of the picture. And because of that, if it does shut down, uh, it won't lead to sort of a new ice age um, in Europe. But what it might do is, um, you know, offset uh, much of the warming and perhaps in some regions lead even to a little bit of cooling. For example, Iceland could actually see some cooling from a shutdown of this ocean current. Now, for a long time, we thought that this wouldn't happen, you know, for decades from now. But um, a study that I was actually involved in a few years ago with uh, scientists uh, from the uh, Potsdam Institute in Germany, Stefan Romstorff and colleagues, we showed in, in a journal, uh, one of the nature journals, that climate change appears to be leading to a slowing down of that current now, not decades from now. And we think it's because Greenland is losing ice earlier than we expected, so that fresh water from the melting ice is flowing into the North Atlantic, making the waters lighter, because fresh water is lighter than, than cold water, um, than salty water, um, and it's inhibiting the sinking motion that sort of drives that conveyor belt. So we think that's happening ahead of schedule. It's an example of where uncertainty isn't our friend. This is one of those impacts that might be playing out earlier than we predicted. Remarkable. Dr. Michael Mann, uh, thank you so much for dropping by, Dr. Mann. It's always great talking with you. Uh, you too, my friend. Thank you.